let's begin the book of Romans and uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 18. This is what it says. It says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them. Notice this. Notice this. Because God has made it plain to them. This is very important. So we're going to talk about this. Let me read the rest of it. It just unfolds. This is one of the most difficult portions of the scripture in the New Testament that you will ever read outside of the book of Revelation and the actual judgment of God. But the wrath of God is being revealed. It's being revealed from heaven. And so he goes on, for since the creation, notice this, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Somebody say amen. So, God is just explaining his case. Just imagine him being, um, you know, the great uh, advocate, but also prosecutor in heaven. He is explaining his case. His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Did you know that? For although they knew God, listen to this, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man being uh, and uh, mortal human beings, I should say, and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Now, you can just imagine, you know, what's, you know what you're, I know what you're thinking. This is our day, right? No, it was Paul's day, but it is our day as well. And worshiped and served uh, created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, it just keeps getting worse. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their own women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with women other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do not they do what uh, they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. This is New Testament. <laughs> this is not Old Testament. All right, All right. let's be reminded because he's the same God. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips slanderers, haters of God, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. Wow. They invent, listen to this, 
they invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding. Now, I disobeyed my parents, so I'm, I'm not pointing fingers here. All of us have been somewhere in this, this line of fire from the Apostle Paul. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love. We're talking about the godless and the wicked. The godless and the wicked. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they do not only continue to do these things, but also approve, listen to this, of those who practice them. Wow. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. It is a great lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, and a light to the world. Thank you, Jesus, for your rebukes and corrections. You show your love this way because you're a good, good father. In your mighty name we pray and everyone said amen. So today we want to study the wrath of God revealed. Everybody say it with me. The wrath of God revealed. The word wrath just simply means this, and you can write it down. I'm going to explain it a little bit more. But basically, in, in God's case, the wrath of God, it literally means vengeance. The vengeance of God. The rep divine retribution and punishment for evil. And God reserves that for himself. I'm not to take that on. I am not to take on any form of that, and I'll explain that here in a minute. But the subject of the wrath of God is, is an uncomfortable one for New Testament Christians. And I'm going to try to help you understand why, but I also want to help you understand how you can speak of it uh, on occasion or when people need to hear it. Um, uh, not in a judgmental way, but in, in a way that kind of brings them closer to God and, and giving their life to Jesus Christ. But this subject of the wrath of God, as uncomfortable as it is for all of us to speak of it and to talk about it, because God is a God of love, God is a God of justness, God is a God, justice, God is a God of mercy. We understand all those things about God. But we struggle uh, with the wrath of God. And we see God and his patience and his willingness to, to hold back his wrath. Why? Because in looking and studying the wrath of God, you and I, as students of God's word, we have to understand the backdrop of, of this whole backdrop of God himself. That, that God not only revealed his and is revealing his wrath from heaven, but he is also revealing his gospel. He is also revealing his goodness. He is also revealing his salvation. He's revealing his son. Hallelujah. He's revealing his forgiveness. He's revealing his patience. His blessings, we talked about the blessings, sung about the blessings of God. Everybody wants to hear about that, but no one wants to hear about the wrath of God. But the wrath has to be coupled with the goodness and what God has revealed. Because people are without excuse today. They are without excuse. And he just states his claim right here. Uh, the last half of chapter 1. So this subject, we must not neglect, and especially preachers, we should not neglect to speak about it, teach about it, help people understand what it is, why it is, and how this fear of God uh, can lead people in the right direction. So we're going to teach what God's Word says about it. And not uh, withhold that good information. I don't know. I mean, obviously, I've talked about the wrath of God, spoken, you know, uh, alluded to it. 
uh, on occasion, but never as a subject, never as a main topic in a uh, sermon uh, for whatever reason. But obviously, coming through the book of Revelation and other books of the Bible, it talks about it, so you hit on it. But this is very interesting. I found it very interesting as I studied this, and I hope you do too. Paul the Apostle goes from... Uh, helping us understand the power of God earlier in the chapter. Remember, he said the power of the gospel is revealed. He's talking about revelation here in chapter 1. God has revealed the power of the gospel. He has revealed the blessings of the gospel. I spoke about that last week. All of this is in chapter 1, but he is also now bringing to bear upon the minds of the readers uh, that God has also revealed his wrath. And so he's helping us understand both so that we can, we can live a balanced life, a, a strong, healthy Christian life. So the book of Romans, Paul, in this book, he uses the word wrath 12 times. I think the most in the, all of the New Testament. And it's very important that that. We understand that because God is speaking, not in not uh, every occasion that he speaks about it is he talking about the wrath of God, but he's, he, he is alluding to it all, almost all the time. And so let's understand, let's talk about understanding the wrath of God. As I said, number one, the wrath of God is revealed by God. No one else can do that. No one else gets to tell God how. Vengeance is going to be repaid. No one. We don't get to do that as Christians. Uh, we, we, we do get to explain it to people so that they can avoid it. Somebody say amen. But the wrath of God is something that people do not understand. But as I said, it is, it is divine retribution and punishment for blatant ongoing practicing of evil eventually sin and evil and evil ways, it catches up with us even if it never does in this life. When we die without Christ, there it is. We experience the punishment of God forever. But the wrath of God, I love what he says, is being revealed. It, the word revealed there means to make known what was previously not known, perhaps, but God says in his word here through the Apostle Paul that he's made it clear really since the beginning of creation. People know about God. They just don't want to acknowledge God. And so they create stories, fictitious stories, about everything or anything that has to do with attributes of God or what God does or who he is as a creator. So they talk about evolution. They talk about anything. But they know, they know if they study creation that they can't deny a creator. They call it nowadays intelligent design. You know, uh, many atheist evolutionists, they can't, they can't, I mean, honestly, they can't deny God because there had to be an intelligent designer of the universe. Or everything would be out of order. Come on, let's let's just, you know, if if I debated somebody, I wouldn't be, you know, a great apologist because I'm I'm just, you know, I'm just so powerful, you know, I, I feel so powerfully the the word of God. I just get emotional about it. So I can't stand there like great apologists and just debate with people and 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 you know contradict all kinds of statistics and things like that. But I can tell you one thing that I would just smile very happily. At, you can't say that nothing created everything. You can't do that. It would not be intellectually honest. And so we see here. And so God is just saying, look, to anyone that says they're an atheist, evolutionist, whatever, you know, the Lord loves them. Somebody say amen. He loves them. And so guess what, Christians? We get to pray for them. Notice what it says in John 3, verse 36. Remember, the wrath of God is being revealed by God. It is his revelation that he is bringing to people. 
I'm telling you, before I got saved, that was one of the revelations God was bringing to me. The wrath of God. <laughs> like, Lord, I don't want to experience that. Help me. Help me, Lord. And so, but John 3, uh, 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him, on them. And this is a fact. So if somebody comes to a knowledge of, of Jesus and they willfully reject, I know, I know, you know, talk show hosts, you know, not, not on the Christian side, but certainly on the secular side, who, when they talk about Jesus, they talk about him as if he never existed or that it was just kind of a figment of people's imagination or whatever. But the fact is, is that they're, they're even, they're saying the name of Jesus. And the fact that they're saying the name of Jesus tells me that God has already dealt with and they have rejected him. And now they're trying to help others practice what they believe about Jesus. It's, it's called discipleship on the wrong side. But rejecting Christ once the Son has been revealed, you can't reject something that you haven't been presented with. So this wrath of God, and what is it? It is the vengeance, divine vengeance, retribution, and punishment for evil. Now, how many know that God is good? He is good. He is patient. He wishes, the Bible says, He wills not any should perish, but all come to repentance. He has sent His Son to us to die and take our punishment, rise again from the dead, conquer death, conquer hell, rise into heaven itself, send the Holy Spirit, Make these things real to us. Listen, if, if I've known Christians who have backslid and gone away from God trying to deny him. You can, if you've ever received Jesus, you can never deny him. You can walk away. You can become reprobate. But oh no, he'll never, he will never leave you. He will be right there with you. He will make it so hard for you not to come back to him. Hallelujah. Because his love is so great. And, and, you know, the fact that, that you feel the, that conviction, that is part of the vengeance of God, the wrath of God. It starts there. Conviction of sin is God's way of stepping into and trying to help you avoid the end result of his wrath. Somebody say amen. Aren't you glad? So, God has revealed His Son, and those who believe in His Son, has, we have eternal life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Number two, understanding the wrath of God. Number one, God has revealed. God and only God can reveal His wrath. But number two, the wrath of God is revealed to be against all the godless and wickedness of people. That's what it says here. Against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. So God loves people. His wrath is against godlessness, what they choose to live, and wickedness. That's what he, he is for people, but he is against what they do. It's like what we say, there's an old saying that we have to remember when it, when it comes to leading people to Christ. We love the sinner, hate the sin. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Why? Because God loves the sinner and hates the sin. Amen? And so it's against, God's wrath is against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. So let's look at godlessness and wickedness. Let's explain it a little bit more so that we can understand the wrath of God better. So number one, wickedness is suppressing the truth. 
when God has revealed the truth about himself, his righteousness and his wrath plainly or whatever he wants to reveal, his blessings, his gospel, his eternal life, his forgiveness. You know, God has revealed those things too, like I said. But when wickedness is suppressing all of that, keeping that from people, instructing people against believing that and and endeavoring to lead people into the lifestyle of a reprobate or uh, a, a, an evil pathway. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, and he and you he made alive. Everybody look at somebody and say, you he made alive. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, which you once walked according to the course of this world, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that is the devil, the spirit that, the, that is the spirit of the devil who now works in the sons of disobedience. Did you know the devil has a spirit too? He, he has wicked spirits, demon spirits. He has, a, he has a powerful sway over people in the world. And it, it, he plays upon the natural man, the evil and fallen nature of man. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Everybody say wrath. We were by nature. That is the transformation God has, has done for you and I. We were children of wrath. Now we are children of God. Not everybody's a child of God, by the way. Not everybody that's born into this world is a child of God. Now, we're going to see here in a moment that we're all offspring of God, obviously because of Adam and Eve and the human race. But to be a child of God is to be born again of the Spirit of God. How many understand what I'm saying? That is what a child of God is. We were by nature children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy, and you can read the rest of that. It's so good. But... I just wanted to explain that, you know, I'm just not pointing the finger here. That was me. And I am so glad. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that Jesus convicted you? He worked with you, brought you out, sent people into your life. They were annoying, but the Lord wanted to annoy you. Part of his wrath. It's just part of his wrath. He wants to send you as an annoying person to somebody. You have an annoying anointing. Somebody say amen. You have an annoying anointing. Amen. And God wants to annoy people through you. Why? To shake them up. To bring them out. To help them wake up. Wrath is surely to come. Jesus looked at the Pharisees that he loves. He, he loved them. He said, who has warned you to flee from the wrath of God? Good question. How about God himself? God has warned you. And so that is our duty as Christians. This is our job. Hallelujah. We get to do it for God. We get to be an annoying blessing for two people. Hallelujah. Some of you are laughing on Facebook. Thank you for that. And on YouTube. Keep laughing because it's true. You're going to annoy somebody. If you're living for God, you're going to annoy them. They might not say it, but you're going to annoy somebody. But they're going to be so happy you did. Hallelujah. So number two, we're talking about godlessness and wickedness. Wick wickedness is suppressing the truth in wickedness when God has revealed the truth about himself already. So explaining who God is and being humble and just saying this is God. I don't necessarily believe in him, but this is who he is. Or believing in him and explaining it out of a true heart. They just don't want to do it. People, that is, that is, the wrath of God is on that person. Number two, this is how godlessness and wickedness is explained by Paul. 
God has revealed the truth of himself through creation so that none are without excuse. Everybody say excuse. In denying him. You can't, you know, if you deny him, you are, you are jumping over hurdles, roadblocks that God is setting in front of you or suppressing the truth in his sight. Let me read something to you. This is so interesting. In Acts chapter 17, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I don't have it on the screen, but I just want to read it to you. Paul is explaining on Mars Hill about the unknown God. They had an idol to the unknown God. And so Paul's just explaining who God is. And, and this is what he says in part. He says, God, and notice this, Paul's explaining who God is. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. I can just see him pointing to the temple there. Nor is he uh, worship with man's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things. And he has made, listen to this, from one blood, that is one humanity, many ethnicities, one humanity. There are not many races. See, this is how the world divides us. There are not, there's only one human race, many ethnicities, and this is where you can find it in the Word of God. It says, He has made from one humanity or one blood every nation. The word nation there is ethnos, which that's where we derive our word ethnicity. One humanity, everybody say it with me, one humanity, many ethnicities, many ethnicities. Just a side lesson so that you will know how to contradict the um, uneducated, wise in their own eyes people. All right. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. This is what God has done and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. How many know God has set nations where they are, and he, he, he wants us to be, you know, kind and good to each other, but he loves nations. Uh, anyway, so that they should seek the Lord. He set boundaries, pre-appointed times, boundaries for many ethnicities so that they would do what? So that they would seek the Lord. They would find out how good he was. Who, what? How do plants grow? How do you raise crops? What is this sun in the sky? How did that get there? I mean, let's think about it. Human beings have had to, had to think through these things, and yet they will deny God. Listen to this. Though he is not, uh, so that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for him, after him, and find him. This is what God did before Christ, obviously, though he is not far from each one of us. This is Paul speaking about God, the unknown God, at Mars Hill to perhaps hundreds or thousands. This I love this scripture, verse 28 of Romans 17. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your poets have said. For we are also his offspring. So Paul acknowledges that some of their poets were correct in their description of the deity of God that were all the human race and the offspring of God. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, see how Paul pulls people in. This is what you believe. And so now I'm going to, boom, I'm going to bring you in. Somebody say amen. It's so good. He goes, uh, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. And this is what I wanted to get to. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. So there was a time. Before Christ, 
that people had to be judged by their conscience, by, you know, their, their even though muddied understanding of God, God would judge them. People have wondered, well, what happened before Christ? How did people... Were there any? Was there anybody in heaven? I'm going to leave that all up to God, but notice this. But now, everybody say, but now. But now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. That is Jesus Christ. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Somebody say amen. And so we're talking about uh, godlessness and wickedness explained, God, there are no excuses anymore. He might have winked at it before, uh, but now there are no excuses. Why? Because God has not only revealed his wrath, he has revealed his son. He has revealed how to be saved through repentance. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Let's look at some more. Number three, we're talking about godlessness and wickedness explained. Godlessness, notice this, is very similar to wickedness, is a denial of the truth of God. It's just not about God's character and who he is. His existence, yes, his righteousness, his gospel, his reward, all of the things about his divine nature, his wrath, and all of it. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking uh, became futile and their foolish hearts darkened. So it starts getting worse. Once, once a person begins to practice this, only God can rescue them. I mean, we can plant seed, we can believe God, but it's so difficult for people to repent in this day and age, especially, it seems, because there's so much distraction that people can jump into, uh, and uh, it just wasn't that way uh, decades ago. But nevertheless, the Holy Spirit is still working. Somebody say amen. He's still working, and he's still bringing people out of godlessness and wickedness and sin. Number four, wickedness and godlessness gives way to darkness. Blindness, foolishness, idolatry, idol worship, and sexual depravity. And this is where it gets worse. You know, as a, as a parent, you are guarding so many things as your children are growing up. So many things. And, and as a Christian parent, it's very, very important that you train your children in biblical morality. And this is what God says. This is how God wants you to behave. This is what God has for you. And people say, well, you know, and I've heard it, uh, especially in, in the circles of, of um, uh, homosexuality and, and lesbianism and that, you know, that I was, I was born this way. No, we were all born this way. We were all born in sin. That's, that's what we were born into. And, and the moment people begin to say and qualify sin as though it is not sin, it's just a part of their nature, which it is a part of their nature, but it's with, you don't have excuse not to repent. Say, I can't change it. God can. God changed me. He can change anybody. It doesn't matter if heterosexual sin or or. Uh, homosexual sin. Somebody say amen. It's still sexual depravity. And, and this is what Paul says. He says, therefore God gave them over to sinful desires in their hearts, uh, of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And he talks about it right here. It's absolutely essential that Christians stand firm in biblical morality. Why? It's because if you don't, people's souls will continue to decline and they will remain in their sin. God doesn't want them to go to hell. Jesus, Jesus doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He wants everyone everywhere to be saved. But sin and the rejection of God and his ways and his word uh, 
you know, take a person there. Let's look at it a little bit more. It's heavy, I know. But remember, we're talking about the goodness of God, how he's revealed his salvation, his blessings, his eternal life, his patience, his, his fullness for us. But he has revealed his wrath against all godlessness and wickedness of people. Number five, wickedness and godlessness leads to even greater depravity. Listen to this. Furthermore, Paul says, just as they did not like to, it, they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so that so God gave them over. See, when God gives you over to something, that's a bad thing. I mean, okay, you're going to cast caution to the wind, so you're going to be driven by the wind. You're going to be driven into those lifestyles, into those dark places. And, and you're going to be an open target for the devil who wants to destroy you. Furthermore, he says, because they didn't think it was worthwhile to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Depraved mind. So that they do what ought not to be done. And they have become filled with every kind of wickedness now, every kind of evil, every kind of greed, every kind of depravity. That could have been me. That could have been you. They are full of envy. You say, Pastor Randy, I wasn't brought up that way. No, nor was I. But I still had a lot of these things in my life. Maybe not murder, uh, certainly strife, deceit, and malice, but that's the way of the carnal nature. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Does that sound like our uh, day and age today? It really does. It's amazing. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. And finally, in talking about wickedness and godlessness of people, let's look at this. Wickedness and godlessness ultimately leads to the intentional rejection of God, his will, his righteous standards. And his encourage and encouraging others, I should say, and in the encouragement of others to practice the rejection of God. They did not know God. They, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such thing deserve death. Wow, they do not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So let's conclude. Come on up here, Curtis. Um, bring down those lights before you come. Let me, let me read this last passage, and then we're going to pray. This is why people find themselves in hell when they pass away. I've heard story after story of people that pass away. Voltaire. Voltaire was a uh, philosopher back several centuries ago. And he did everything his, he could to destroy the Bible. Bible, it's fable. The Bible is fable. And so he spent his whole life endeavoring to disprove the Bible, disprove God. Can you imagine that? Uh just bent on it. Uh, Voltaire, look it up. Uh, just a sad, sad way to spend your life. Fighting against the church, fighting against preachers, the gospel, the word of God, God himself, burning Bibles, you know, by the stacks full, persecuting Christians, lying against them, just defaming. He lived terrible life, but he was a philosopher. And, um, and isn't that the way it is today? People think that they know more than God and they look at what we do as us following some sort of fable, fairy tale, but we know better. So Voltaire, when he died, it is recorded 
the day that he died, he's laying there, he's still breathing, and suddenly, near death, he awoke, eyes wide open. He sits straight up, and he screams, a blood-curdling scream, oh no, oh no, oh no. And he talked about, he just the flames of God and and all of these, you know, I, I can't remember everything that he said, but the terror, the terror of seeing what he thought was a fairy tale. And I've heard stories like that over and over, but I've also heard stories of my relatives and others who have passed on and it was beautiful and they saw heaven and they saw the angels of God and they saw the glory of heaven itself and they came back and told about it my wife's dad Warren died at a very young age Kim was six years old he died and came back and told the story of seeing heaven over here he was standing on this this precipice of uh, this cliff but over there he saw heaven, the angel pointed to it, and he could just feel the glory of God. And then he looked over his shoulder, the angel pointed to hell itself, and terror came over him. He was a good Christian. He goes, oh no, I don't want to go there. He goes, you're not going there. And so after a while he, he came back and he told the story, very powerful. They still have the, the tape. They, sh they should probably get it digitally made. But Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 says this. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, this is Ephesians, this is New Testament, nor covetous man, nor an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Come on, let's stand. Praise God. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come fly. Fill the air. 